very excited to have you guys join us for this wonderful talk. As you know, our speaker today needs no introduction, but um, I'll keep it br brief. So Dr. Joseph Sharp, as we know, is a professor in otolaryngology, had a neck surgery at the Cleveland Clinic um, Learner College of Medicine. And um, we all know that he's an expert in head and neck surgery, as well as um, spe specifically in the endocrine surgery. Um, he is uh, actually internationally renowned in endocrine surgery and um, has been very active in all of the societies, including American Head and Neck Society, uh, American Thyroid Association, as well as ACS. And uh, recently he was um, named our Vice Chair for Professional Development and Continuing Education. He's done a lot of training here, um, including residency here at the Cleveland Clinic, went to Iowa for a fellowship and came back to be uh, part of our team here. And so I'm very excited to have um, Joe present this morning on advances in aggressive thyroid cancer and treatment. Thank you so much, Joe. Great. Thank you, Dr. Koo. It's, it's, it's a real honor to be here to speak at my own institution. And uh, I really want to commend Dr. Koo and Christine for all that they've done with this Grand Round series. It's just been such a nice additive component to our program that we haven't had in the past. And I've really enjoyed it. Um, I'm speaking on a topic I've enjoyed myself with thyroid cancer. And it's interesting as I reflect because earlier in my career, I thought at my, I'd be more of a practice that would be half microvascular free flaps, half ablative surgery. And I thought actually, of all things, thyroids I always enjoyed, but I thought maybe it might be a hedge against some of the devastation of squame and better outcomes, what have you, but it just grew on me, grew on me, grew on me. And I, I really became fascinated with a single organ where you can have a cancer where you could just watch it maybe, and it's going to be indolent, all the way up to probably the worst cancer known to humankind in, in anaplastic cancer. And that just doesn't happen in other organs. You have a pancreas or a, or a lung cancer, it's bad. But uh, thyroid cancer could be all over the place. And so we're going to kind of explore that a bit today. Um, in terms of, um, let's see if this thing will advance here. In terms of uh, disclosures, I, I really don't have many. I did a book with Dr. Greg Randolph on intraoperative nerve monitoring this year. And, and some of the stuff that I'll be speaking of will certainly have that uh, present within it. Um, most everyone here is familiar with these images, particularly the cryo building where my office is. Uh, but not as much, uh, everyone might not be quite as familiar with Dr. Kreil and some of his accomplishments, including a radical neck dissection described over 100 years ago. Uh, but he also holds, interestingly, the record for the most thyroid surgeries at the Cleveland Clinic, 33 in one day. <laughs> and there's a picture of him in my office doing his 25,000 thyroid surgery. And, and back then, the Cleveland Clinic was a place where uh, thyroid surgery could be done safely. Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, Leahy Clinic, all very important institutions for thyroid surgery. As I look at the contemporary approach to thyroid cancer and being a thyroid uh, specialist, it's changed dramatically. And so surgeons now really have to be endocrinologists. We have to speak the language of endocrine. We have to be radiologists performing our own office in, in ultrasound so we could do what's best for our patients. We have to be geneticists. I was actually a biochemistry major in, in uh, college, and you get away from that a little bit doing what Dr. Natalie Silver does. I used to really enjoy that, but now you have to come back to it a bit. You have to be medical oncologists, familiar with target therapies, multidisciplinary integration, radiation oncologies with external beam for certain patients, anesthesiologist, making sure your nerve monitoring tubes are placed well, and then being a, an electrophysiologist even to make sure that you're, you're following all the protocols, nuclear medicine specialists, thyroid tumor boards, and now we have the upcoming issue of focused practice designation for complex thyroid, parathyroid surgery, which I'll certainly get into with the trainees with some of my role in development uh, for them. This is a publication that came out over the summer um, from one of our uh, residents who just graduated, I was involved with it, Dr. Kevin Contrera. And it's interesting because this is going to be a little bit of a theme of some of the stuff I'll talk upon, but you could see all of a sudden all the, the mutational landscape and the targets that we have for thyroid cancer that really weren't existent as early as five, six years ago. And so all of a sudden we're discovering these new targets for these cancers that may not have been even resectable, or maybe we could lower the morbidity of the resection. And so you may find patients that may have a medullary cancer 
that is unresectable, but they're red positive and you can use selpercatinib and it changes the, the whole entire uh, structure of your treatment plan. And so this is a very, very important kind of theme that you're going to see throughout some of the lecture and where we're going with molecular testing and what it can offer us to give our best uh, patient outcomes. So as important as target therapies are, uh, a surgical approach still, I think, is the most targeted, personalized approach. And I'm going to use some of my own cases, illustrative cases, to kind of uh, illustrate those values in a surgical approach. Um, there have been simultaneously evolving factors with new surgical techniques. We have intraoperative nerve monitoring that continues to advance. There's new advanced parathyroid imaging techniques, which I'm not going to speak on. In some areas, particularly in Asia, they're using radiofrequency ablation on thyroid cancers. We've not had that approved or using that for in the United States. Uh, remote access approaches are, are present, and some of our residents have been taking a lead. Former residents have been taking a lead on that, like John Russell and others. Um, we do have new radiation techniques that have improved to decrease morbidity, and then I've already alluded to some of these new targeted biologic regimens. So this is what our tumor board tends to look like. We've got our medical oncologists here turning some patients green. We have our radiation oncologists. We have to do a good job ourselves getting there and trying to get out of the OR and out of our clinics. But there's always there's always bias in the decision process, bias on the part of the surgeon, the endocrinologist, medical oncologist, the radiation oncologist, even the patient and family. But there really is this value for these more aggressive, difficult cases that I'm going to show to have your tumor board involved. When we look at aggressive thyroid cancer treatment, I'm going to look at some of the contemporary surgical strategies with a site-specific approach, also touch upon these surgical adjuncts. Second phase of the talk, we'll go over the predicting the biologic behavior of, par of papillary thyroid cancer prior to treatment, also speaking about how we define the response to treatment today, which I think has been a great advancement, and then integrating neoadjuvant and adjuvant treatments into care for invasive cancers and anaplastic cancer. So what is an aggressive cancer? We often can kind of tell what it is, but there is definitional controversy. In otolaryngology, we might say it's invasive, bulky, non-resectable. Endocrinologists might say it's radioactive iodine refractory. Medical oncology might look at it from a distant metastatic view. When pathologists look at this, they're gonna see a certain characteristics of the tumor as it loses the differentiation from going from well-differentiated to tall cell, to insular, to anaplastic. Iodine resistance will increase, the biologic aggressiveness will increase, PET scan positivity will increase, and then the risk of recurrence and extent of surgery is going to increase as well. I don't want to give a false view that all these are terrible cancers. As I said, I'm going to be talking about mostly the bad ones, but uh, in general, as we've seen this uh, very well-known uh, paper from Louise Davies, we've seen an increase in incidence, but not death from thyroid cancer. What this graph doesn't show us, though, is some of the morbidity that comes from the management. Different endpoints aren't being looked at, and so that's very important to find the best functional outcomes from our patients as well. And moving on to our site-specific management, I'll speak first about some invasion to strap constrictor muscle, laryngotracheal invasion, vessel invasion, esophageal invasion. Of course, of interest to the, uh, the trainees and the uh, surgeons is the nerve involvement, and maybe some difficult situations and how to manage those with adjuncts like nerve monitoring, and then also rehabilitation strategies that could be so valuable. The extrathyroidal tissue at risk is so well known to everyone, but these will certainly be the strap muscles, the trachea, the esophagus, great vessels uh, that will be put at risk from thyroid cancer and its location. I have been working uh, with Dr. Mark Erkin, Maisie Shindo, uh, and Mark Zafario on a, a staging system for invasive cancer. It's in the process of publication right now, so keep an eye out for this. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the site-specific management has never really been kind of looked at in a staging system. That's what we're aiming to do so that we'll have a common language for studies going forward uh, for our patients and description for other surgeons. Before I get into exact cases, it's so critical to always talk about the preoperative examination and the importance of not being taken by surprise. So most patients are actually asymptomatic. There are very few guidelines or recommendations provided, but when you see something that's abnormal, strider, hemoptysis, growth, pain, prior surgery, recurrent disease, you really need to intensify the workup. 
with tracheoscopies, and I'll show those, bronchoscopies, DLs, cross-sectional imaging, so that you're aware of what's going on. You could do the best, most complete resection or care for a patient. This is a particular patient here that I'm just gonna show the importance of that on. It was a 24-year-old patient who was referred in to me. She had had a surgery by a very good surgeon, had a total thyroidectomy, lateral neck dissection. Her thyroglobulin was increasing, went up to three. Um, and it had been a tall cell variant. And so ultimately a PET scan was done, which showed this uh, lesion of a metastasis in the peripharyngeal space. But it's interesting when you go back and look at her film before her outside surgery, which was present, and you could see that node before the surgery right there in the fat in the peripharyngeal space. And so review all your own films. And so if you had that patient, you could simply go up there. That's the ninth nerve. We've divided the digastric muscle and we're able to get that node out. This is another patient actually here from the Cleveland Clinic. This is a patient of mine who had obvious lateral neck disease in the, in the right lateral neck with the calcifications in it. But this was not called by our own radiologist prior to my surgery on this patient, but we noticed it ahead of time. And once again, by noticing it before the surgery, after we've done the lateral dissection, it's easy to get up there and take care of that at the same setting rather than having to go back and look for it and deal with it at a second stage. Never forget to secure the diagnosis. I've seen every single one of these diagnoses and we've published publications in our own institution with metastasis to the thyroid. It's a very vascular organ. We'll be speaking at the end about anaplastic cancer and that's gonna have some unique uh, treatment uh, possibilities that are, that are coming forward. As we look at the guidelines from the American Thyroid Association, the most recent guidelines really haven't changed. When technically feasible, surgery for air digestive tract invasions recommended in combination with radioactive iodine and or external beam radiotherapy. I did do a paper that uh, was published a few years ago from the HNS, and many of these papers are all on the HNS website, and they're a good resource to look at looking at uh, comprehensive management of thyroid cancer and these recurrent cancers and more invasive cancers. And uh, if anything in my lecture will probably pretty much be within some of these papers. Another very important paper from my friend Maisie Shindo is also there showing the management of invasive uh, cancer uh, on the AHNS website. So time to go down the yellow brick road here and uh, get into a few cases um, in this site specific approach that I've already said. Um, when we have invasion to the strap constrictor muscle, it is uh, one of the more common areas where cancer will go to. Uh, fortunately, with improved high resolution ultrasound, experienced operators, you can appreciate this ahead of time. And there isn't much morbidity. You could take a very generous muscle margin from patients, little functional loss. And so this is a patient who had been referred in. She had prior outside surgery, recurrent tall cell variant. She was told there was nothing further that could be done. Although this is not a situation that's gonna let somebody die peacefully. And um, we talked about at the tumor board, the carotid artery is quite involved here, although, and the jugular vein was obliterated. Um, and so we uh, elected to take her for a surgical approach. Um, we were able to actually preserve uh, everything. We were able to get to a subadventitial plane on the carotid to protect the carotid, phrenic nerve, 11th nerve, brachial plexus, we took all the constrictor muscle out right onto the cartilage of the thyroid and trachea. She had had her nerve removed on her prior surgeries. And uh, complex and the, the, the trachea is more commonly involved but when the larynx gets involved, it's certainly more symptomatic with hemoptysis, dyspnea, horse, hoarseness. And it's easy to be misled by a lack of symptoms. So airway narrowing can be slow, often cross-sectionally compromised. You need 50% or more before you start to lose your airway and have a lot of symptoms. And there's definitely instances, even though we have a very good ear for it, where the voice can be perceived as normal with a paralyzed cord. This is uh, an adaptation from McCaffrey's article that Mark Urkin wrote showing the pattern of invasion. The most common pattern is for a uh, invasion around the thyroid cartilage, just like you would see here, where it comes right in towards the piriform sinus. You can have a nodal invasion. I'll show some case of that. So it's so important to do a, a proper central neck dissection and clear out all 
gross disease with therapeutic neck dissections. You can have a combination of coming around the thyroid cartilage and direct invasion, and then other uh, areas of just simple direct invasion. The latter goes from a simpler shave or tangential approach or excision, which is most common, though it does have its limitations, to a window resection, which is limited, but does take care of issues of lymphatic spread within the trachea. Most commonly, I do tracheal resections or segmental resections, and then you can have situations where you need an extended tracheal resection, and sometimes even a laryngectomy or laryngo uh, pharyngectomy if there's loss of organ uh, function and uh, there's not another option, although we really try to avoid that. We don't see that in the, in the primary setting often. It's usually in the recurrent setting, um, and we're looking to do organ preservation as much as we can. This would be an example of uh, tracheal invasion. This is a shin stage four. Um, once again, uh, the importance of cross-sectional imaging, you may not appreciate that in an ultrasound since it may be under the clavicles, but you can certainly appreciate it here with a direct evaluation. And that's not going to be something we can do a simple shave resection. And so for this patient, she's had a segmental resection performed here uh, with a primary anastomosis. Uh, there is uh, evidence-based literature for quality improvement of life after these procedures, and it is a very standard procedure to, to help patients in these situations. Not everything within the trachea necessarily in, means invasion, so this would be a real shame to put someone through the risk of a tracheal invasion then find out later that this was just a benign thyroid rest, which it was. And so you want to have biopsy proof before embarking on something of that nature, and you could get a sense from the film that this may not be an invasive cancer, but you can get uh, thyroid tissue within the trachea and you want to know what's going on. For a patient like that, you might be able to treat them with hormone and suppress it. You may be able to do a debulking. There's other options for this type of situation. This is a patient who had had a, um, a tracheal resection by a surgeon prior to seeing me, uh, with, not a tracheal resection, but I'm shot, sorry, a shave or tangential resection. And the patient started to have difficulties with her voice she was having a lot of uh, whispering difficulties, and you could see this paralysis of the left vocal cord, and you could see where that tangential or shave resection was done right here. And unfortunately, a year later, this is what resulted. It came back. And so I work with Dr. Milstein and the voice uh, center for our multidisciplinary approach. He does this tracheoscopy right there in the office, gets patients numbed up, gets a beautiful view. We know exactly what we're dealing with and what we see. When we get in there in those cases, you could see the degree of scarring and things that might be a bit trivial, like finding a carotid artery, aren't so trivial. And so these are difficult cases. And so this was a resection with a primary anastomosis, and the patient did very well. This is another patient, actually from the same surgeon, sent it over to me within two weeks of that prior case. Same thing where a tangential or shave resection was done. And this patient also was having difficulty um, with a uh, voice, hopefully the video will play there. We'll see, maybe it's not going to play. But um, you could see that issue of the um, uh, re re the um, in inflammation and the uh, invasion right into the uh, trachea there. And this patient did have mobility of the vocal cords, but there was a mass with hemoptysis. Sorry about that video there, it didn't seem to play. Uh, the patient um, ended up having a tracheal resection once again, intense scarring present there, but we were able to achieve negative margins for that particular patient. This is another patient, hopefully this video will play, we'll see what happens here. Yeah, this is playing. So this patient came in and uh, was essentially breathing through a um, coffee straw. This was a primary case, which is a bit unusual. Dr. Milstein did a nice video. This is all the way back in 2011, as you can see from the screen but the patient was breathing very difficult from the uh, invasion of this uh, tumor. And this was a situation where, like I said, we really like to avoid this situation, but there was just no way to get organ preservation for the patient with the gross destruction of the trachea. And so we did a laryngectomy, but we did do a primary TEP and fitting, which I think has been a really nice advance for all our patients to get them an immediate and very quick uh, reconstitution of function swallowing and uh, the patient actually uh, just passed away recently 11 years later from other causes and so it done quite well. The data is often limited it's a mixture of operations for palliative and curative intent that's why we need to get better data that's why I've been working with Dr. Erkin and 
Maisie Shindo to get our staging system together so we can have the same language and, and start to get better prospective studies looking at um, uh, contemporary markers like thyroglobulin, ultrasound, uh, Bronx, those type of things that we need to get within our literature. When we look at the issue of tangential versus shave resection, uh, although overall survival looks pretty nice at five years and 10 years, it starts to become a lot more sobering at 10 year when you look at disease-free survival. And some of these patients are gonna come to you at young ages and you're thinking about decades of control for them and um, controlling their disease. There's no question that a complete versus incomplete resection is going to result in a better outcome, but finding that balance could be difficult at times. Many of these patients may come in with an advanced age, other comorbidities, they may have distant mets, and finding that balance is a very individualized approach where we engage patients and family in the ultimate decision for care. As we look at major, major vessel resection, we do run into that problem as well, as I showed some of the um, proximity to the major vessels. And so there is a potential to remove a carotid artery or major vessels, um, but we do like the multidisciplinary approach, vascular surgery teams available, balloon test occlusion. I do like to do inline bypass grafting, even if a balloon test occlusion is good, it's not a perfect test. And so I do like to do then their support from our squamous cell literature regarding the balloon test occlusion uh, for the safety of this procedure. And so a patient uh, of this nature who is going to have a, uh, this is actually just not a thrombus, but this is actually cancer within the internal jugular vein. It's an insular variant. Insular variants could tend to go into these great vessels. Um, there's not much morbidity to just take the internal jugular vein during the neck dissection on the same setting. You can't take them on both sides at the same setting. But that would be very, very rare, but you can certainly take a jugular vein without, without much uh, uh, compromise or functional morbidity. When we get to the carotid, it becomes a little bit trickier. And this is a patient who had an outside surgery with a recurrence, and you could see it lighting up right here. Take note of the lung and take note of that little frond of the lung coming right up to this area. And as we went in there to relieve out the cancer off the carotid artery, you could see I'm developing a subadventitial plane here. So then here's your adventitia, here's the subadventitial plane. You can't get any deeper that, than that. Then you're into tunica media. You've lost control of the operation. You may have a catastrophic vascular injury. And so you can't get any deeper than there. And so as we start to relieve this tumor off of the carotid artery, you can see it coming further and further off of the carotid artery, the anominate. And as I relieve it further and further here, it's been totally removed. And now I'm looking at lung actually. So that's that frond of the lung that was coming up and that's lung tissue right there with a little hole in the um, parietal pleura. Um, not much uh, problem with this either, actually. It's not the visceral pleura. And so you could try to close this primarily, although it's gonna be very difficult. A better approach for this is just simply putting a, a, a suction drain in, just like you'd have a chest tube. And so I put a suction drain in the neck and the patient did very well and out of the hospital quite quickly. Esophageal invasion, often limited to the muscular esophagus, but um, you can have, uh, what, what is fortunate is you often have sparing of the submucosa and mucosa. And so there's a potential to resect the, and clear the disease from the muscle. I like to use a Maloney dilator because I like to use a, a scalpel to relieve this tissue. And you need to be ready to do a flap or repair if you, or have a team member present if you're not comfortable doing that. And so in these situations, this is a patient who has had um, obviously lateral neck disease here on the left side. And then you can see the primary tumor here on the left thyroid. Um, as we start to look at this situation and go further down, this tumor continues to go down into the chest. And this is not a goiter. This isn't going to just simply deliver up. And you can see tumor all the way down here into the tracheoesophageal groove. His nerve was compromised on presentation. This is discussed at the multidisciplinary tumor board. This is a patient I'd have seen by thoracic on backup. You could see its proximity and, and location to the major vessels and also have a reconstruction team present. And so the patient, fortunately, I was able to relieve all of the cancer through the neck itself without the thoracic team. And this is muscle here. I went right to the submucosa and I was able to just relieve all of that muscle out. This is a Maloney dilator that's placed in there to give you that counter traction as you relieve all the muscle out of the patient. Uh, but you want to have that entire team present. There are situations where you're going to get uh, tracheal and esophageal invasion. So if you have the esophagus invaded, the trachea is right there. 
And so this was a patient who was in her 50s, um, had had multiple surgeries at a great institution with really good surgeons, and they had done multiple shave resections and it kept recurring. She had been actually peg and trach, de and trach dependent for a period of time and then started to develop this mass right here in this location. And so she was referred over to me and prior to sticking a needle into that mass, you want to think about what the next step is going to be. And for this patient, we have to think differently than what the other surgeons had done. And I knew the other surgeons. And so we have to think much differently um, because I can't have confidence I could go in there and simply do a better shave resection than they did. And so she was younger. She's otherwise functional. She wanted this relieved. And um, so we ended up doing that. I ended up doing the biopsy, proving it was recurrent cancer, persistent cancer. You can see all the scarring, the submucosal nature of this. And so we had our full team available and I ended up with a tracheal uh, uh, resection with negative margins. I held off on going to the other side because you had a solitary nerve there, although it is not unreasonable to do a full segmental resection in primary anastomosis. You have this esophageal defect that's present here as well. And I was a little bit worried that simply trying to close this on itself was gonna create uh, too much stricture difficulty. And so fortunately, I've got my partner, a great surgeon, Dr. Fritz, who is available, and he came in and we did a free flap actually on the patient. And uh, we'll see if that plays. Oh, that'd be a shame if it didn't. It looks like it may not. But he ended up um, putting a free flap in where he had a uh, one paddle for the um, mucosal defect of the esophagus and another paddle for the tracheal defect and then de epithelialize the central segment. And then this was the patient who got decannulated several weeks later, very good stability of her airway here, which it doesn't seem to be showing, unfortunately, but she's continued to do very well uh, overall in her course of treatment. This is a picture of her from uh, a post-operative picture. You could see the free flap in position here, taking care of both that tracheal defect and also the esophageal defect. And uh, she's done well without any uh, recurrence within the neck. Now she has had distant metastatic disease and been treated with that, and that's been going well for him. We're gonna to touch upon some of those strategies in our multidisciplinary approach. It is critical as I keep mentioning that word, keep saying multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary to have a multidisciplinary approach. And this case will really illustrate that importance of the multidisciplinary approach. And so I uh, had a patient, oh boy, over 10 years ago sent over. He was a tax attorney, he came to see me around January or February, he couldn't even breathe. He had been worked up for an asthma. He didn't have asthma, no significant past history, normal true vocal cord motion, but he had an audible stride on inspiration. He had been new thyroid. He had not had any significant thyroid enlargement in his neck by his report. When you looked at his plain film, you can see this mass here within the uh, plain film pushing the trachea well over. And as we start to look at a little bit further with cross-sectional imaging, most of this was in the lower neck and you could see right here it's just beginning below the clavicle and it starts to go deep and you could see why his trachea was compromised his esophagus and you could see that difficulty of breathing that he was having and it kept going further and further and further so this is the same mass even going deeper and deeper all the way down to the carina essentially for this patient i put up this here need for an fna is an fna dangerous creating hemorrhage there would it compromise his airway further um, we elected to do an FNA on them, but these are situations when you have a thyroid deep in the neck like that, it could be hard. These are more ideal when you have, a, this is a different patient, but this hourglass configuration where you have a lot of tissue within the neck where you can pull it right on up, as opposed to this situation of the teardrop, like the patient I just showed, where most of the thyroid is in the chest, the person's kyphotic, spine surgery. These are sometimes much more difficult to get out through just a transcervical approach. We end up doing the FNA on the patient. Um, it, it was suspicious for follicular neoplasm. Uh, at the time, we didn't really do much molecular testing 10 years ago. And so that's been a big advance now for us. But about that time of Bethesda stage um, four, it probably put it about a 20 to 30% chance of malignancy. Uh, we went to the OR. Um, we're always involved with the airway management at the beginning of the cases. I hang around to make sure tubes are placed well, making sure everything is safe for the anesthesiologist. You don't want them to get in a difficult position because a patient like this, you can't emergently trach, not like a laryngeal cancer where you go find some space underneath. These are very difficult because 
it's going into the chest and you're not going to be able to do an emergent tracheotomy. You might be able to get a cricothyroidotomy, but a, a trach is going to be hard. Um, we were able to actually remove it transcervically without the thoracic team. We did not have to open the chest. Um, it's great having them on standby, and uh, we were able to get it all out completely for the patient, which was wonderful. But um, we got the pathology back, and so no case is really ever done until you look at that final pathology, and it ended up being papillary thyroid cancer, 10 and a half centimeters, no angio lymphatic invasion, pathologic T3, there were five nodes that were negative. I took him back for a completion thyroidectomy. It was uncomplicated, and it was a negative uh, specimen on the contralateral side. Well, this all sounds really great, but when you start to look at his course, and one of the advantages of being here for such a long time is you start to see patients in a, a longer longitudinal view, not everything was perfect in his course. And so he ended up getting a bone metastasis to the, to the sternum. It came right here. So you can see all the thyroid that had been there is gone. He's been relieved of that thyroid, but he ended up getting a bone mat, and you can see the bone right around there. And so this was three years after that initial surgery. We talked about that at the multidisciplinary tumor board about where to go with the radiation, palliation. We decided to actually do a resection, and this time we really did have the thoracic surgeons on board. So they went ahead and did a sternal resection of the area. I uh, reconstructed with bilateral pectoralis flaps. I rotated into the area. Our radiation team gave him 64 gray of radiation therapy. I still see this patient, you know, 10 years later, and it's fascinating seeing the pumping of his great vessels right through the chest because all that bone is gone in that area. Uh, but he's continued to do well from the local region, but not everything's been perfect. It's been a difficult course. This is a very recent scan of him 10 years after his initial treatment from February. He has had covarial mets in which he's needed radiation. He's had iliac mets where he's had radiation, SBRT, improvements in radiation techniques to help him. He's had an adrenalectomy. This is a patient every time we take tissue out of, we're going to send for next generation sequencing. Once again, looking for targets that didn't even exist 10 years ago to try to take care of a patient of this nature to get a better outcome for him. And he's still practicing as a tax attorney and, and overall uh, managing through life, but not been a, a very smooth course. But once again, the importance of that multidisciplinary course. I'm going to switch a little over to laryngeal nerve invasion, which is uh, of utmost importance to surgeons, um, the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And so this is a patient who was sent to me uh, by one of my partners. One of my partners had removed a lipoma from the left neck. It was, in fact, a lipoma. But during that workup, they found a mass right here in the left thyroid. The mass got worked up, and it was a positive mass by the um, uh, uh, FNA. The residents with me told me not to worry about doing a scope because he had been scoped by my partner, and, and he was right. Uh, the guy sounded great, and you could see the nice bulk of the vocal cord, but that's not a normal vocal cord examination. And when you look at where that tumor is, it's sitting right there in the tracheoesophageal groove. So once again, when you look at that on scope exam, that's a, a vocal cord that's not moving correctly on the left side. And so we know that ahead of time. We're not going to get caught unaware for this particular patient. And so when I got in there, certainly you could see that nerve being invaded. This is the cancer on the left side. You could see that gross nerve invasion. This is sometimes a complex decision, and it's made based on physical findings, like that scope examination, looking at the true vocal cord motion, pathologic findings, electrophysiologic data, and I'm a, I'm a member of the International Nerve Monitor Study Group, and there's guidelines there for you to review to help you manage through these situations. And so that particular patient, we ended up making sure the nerve was okay on the other side, protected the nerve on the other side first. Then I felt much more aggressive here to take that nerve, and I'm glad I did. It was grossly infiltrated. Um, I took some of the, the muscle on the esophagus, and the patient's actually done quite well long term. Here's another nerve that is grossly invaded, and there was no way we could save that nerve not working correctly, and that nerve was resected. Um, and so we could put that one to rest, certainly. Um, this is not a nerve that's invaded. This is a nerve that's very much working and intact, and the thyroid has actually been already removed, 
And these are all lymph nodes underneath the nerve. On the right side, you always have to do a really complete removal of these nodes. And you just have to take your time with these cases to clear out all this central node disease. So this is not an invaded nerve, but a nerve that needs to be preserved and take your time to clear out all the nodes, particularly on the right side. On the left side, there's not as much room because the nerve doesn't come around the subclavian artery like it does on the right side. So it, by nature of it coming around that subclavian artery, and some of the lymphatics that come with the inferior thyroid artery, there's a lot of lymphatic bearing tissue under that right nerve, a common area for recurrence that needs to be cleared. Sometimes the situations could be a little bit more uh, difficult to figure out what to do. This was a 26 year old patient sent to me. She had had four or five surgeries prior to seeing me and kept having recurrences. And uh, when we reviewed this, um, I got in there and I found her carotid artery, took a lateral approach. Here's her nerve here. And you could see in contrast to those other nerves, it's not completely blown out. The nerve was actually functioning. She had gross invasion into constrictor and cricothyroid muscle. And you could see all of that tall cell variant that was going to connective tissue. And I didn't feel that if I were to be more aggressive to take that nerve on that patient, I was going to get a better resection for her. And so I kept the nerve and uh, at her young age, 26, we actually did elect to do external beam radiation on her uh, to have more confidence and control of this area. And she's continued to do very well for many years now uh, for uh, sterilizing in that fashion. All right, so good outcome for her. All right, here's another illustrative case of a patient who had a lump in her neck, 25 year old patient. Uh, unremarkable history. You could see that lump in the neck here, the cancer that was present. Um, we ended up um, looking at her a little bit more closely and you could see gross disease within the thyroid, also did ultrasounds on her. You could see it on both sides, neck disease, uh, multi-level contralateral disease present. This is a patient, as you look higher up by the mandible, again, multi-level bilateral disease in this particular patient biopsy proven uh, concerns uh, present. Um, we did a laryngeal examination. Her vocal cords were moving correctly. Um, sent for cytology. And I also sent for thyroglobulin testing for these patients when I have these kind of systems. Um, very important to do basic metabolic testing. I've had patients sent in to me where they've had thyroid surgery and they've had a concomitant parathyroid condition. You want to know that parathyroid condition before you show up to do thyroid surgery and vice versa if you're doing a parathyroid surgery. Um, the needle biopsy was actually atypia, blood was present, but I did send it for a thyroglobulin, as I said, and her thyroglobulin was off the chart at 113. So that made me comfortable that this is exactly what we were dealing with, even though I didn't have diagnostic tissue. And so is that good enough for the OR? Um, you know, you can only take patients back so many times for so many biopsies. She's young, she's anxious, she wants to get an answer. And so um, in the beginning of the neck dissection, I plan on taking that node out, which I did, send it for a frozen section to confirm the diagnosis and then proceed on with the surgery. And so I can send her for a total thyroid bilateral neck dissection. I did an early uh, frozen section. I do like to do the neck management on the patients first before getting to the thyroid and the central neck um, because it opens up the neck in the center a bit and also gives you some nerve signal off the vagus. And so I did that. And I cleared out the um, right neck first. It went very well. I had a very good vagal signal. Um, she was just really sucked in. It, it was a diffuse sclerosing variant. And I got the thyroid out. And you can see the nerve. This is superior by the head. This is her uh, inferior constrictor muscle by the cricopharyngeus. This is inferior towards the feet. Found the nerve inferiorly. And this was a node actually, not um, an invasion from the thyroid itself, but we cleared out quite a few nodes in the thyroid. And here was her nerve, here was her nerve, and it was completely fixed, completely stuck. So we're looking at this uh, situation in level B here, in illustration B, where a node is invading the, um, the uh, nerve. And this is a difficult one because here she's got tumor on the right side, but she's also got disease on the left side and left side, and she's 25 years old. And so if I were to persist on trying to be aggressive here, I may lose signal. And then I don't want to put someone through the risk of a bilateral vocal cord paralysis at, at a single setting. We want to keep control for her airway. And so I elected in this situation to, to go to the contralateral side. I did nothing further here, went to the contralateral side in this patient, was able to find and clear out the nerve, although it was very involved with this cancer. And then with the nerve being fine on the other side, I was able to be far more aggressive here 
with sharp dissection and uh, take this tumor off of here um, uh, for her. And I, and I held off on taking her particular nerve. And so that's not a good situation when you're looking at a, a nerve that's getting invaded and you could potentially lose signal and you don't want to have a bilateral vocal cord paralysis for a patient. And so my neuromonitoring data on that patient was telling me I had a very good vagal signal, my V1, my R1 was good below the tumor. Amplitude was remaining over 50% with a good palpation twitch. So if you're in a cost restrictive environment where you can't use nerve monitoring tubes, this is always a great go-to and one of the first troubleshooting things I always do if I lose signal to feel for a palpation twitch at one milliamp. And that will work. You're not going to have a lost nerve or, lo or an non-functioning nerve if you get a good posterior cricoarytenoid muscle twitch with a one milliamp stimulus. And so we ended up um, working on that nerve. I don't do a lot of continuous intraoperative nerve monitoring, but you can go ahead and use the intermittent nerve monitoring very frequently to almost turn it into a continuous monitoring situation to see if you're getting a degradation of signal you have to change things so you don't get traction on a nerve. And so in that nerve, it was encased by the node, as I showed you. I ended up going to the other side to address it. Didn't want to um, leave her with this disease. So we finished the other side, had good signal, then came back and I was able to be much more aggressive on that particular patient, integrating nerve monitoring to be able to get the best outcome. And so in these situations, I always like to consult with some of my friends and see what they would do and what kind of techniques they use in these situations. And um, we have publications that are out from the International Nerve Monitor Study Group where if a nerve resection is required, consider going to the other side first. And if you don't have any loss of signal, then you could be more aggressive, resect an invaded nerve. But if you lose signal, then you have that risk of bilateral vocal cord paralysis and you want to think about maybe staging it or coming back at another time, perhaps. I do like to use some of my microsurgical instruments that I used to use in the past when I get in those situations, these little micro scissors are great. Using one to 10,000 of topical epi pledges are great too because it won't compromise the nerve and it will really help clear up any, um, uh, maintain hemostasis for you during these uh, resections. This is the document. <laughs> I'm right here in the middle of a very large group of people of this group, but this is a great group. The International Nerve Monitor Study Group was studied, started by Henning Drale from Essen in Germany and Greg Randolph, and it's got some wonderful documents for managing these invaded nerves uh, for future reference. Uh, we also have a lot of this within our book that I put out with Greg Randolph this year, and you could, you could see that also. There is a part one of the document of staging bilateral surgery, and then this part two is managing an invaded nerve. Uh, we do have a position state from statement from the American Academy of Otolaryngology. I was chairing the um, the uh, the the uh, inter interoperative cranial nerve monitoring group. So there's a position statement on our website. There was also a publication that we put out on critical review consensus statement for nerve monitoring and head and neck uh, surgery. So what are we going to do to fix the nerve? Uh, we talked about a lot of problems with the nerve, but we're a field that's really well equipped to deal with this nerve and deal with any eventualities that might occur. And so if we get this situation, um, this is a publication that we did uh, in the past looking at different options. And a lot of surgeons will stop right here where the nerve goes in, but you could start to open up this cricopharyngeus muscle and the inferior constrictor and get a lot more nerve. And so when we've done cadaver studies, we found we could get up to 14, 15 millimeters of nerve when we mark a stitch. And so you could clear a margin. I love doing answer to recurrent nerve anastomosis. We're a busy cardiac center. We've done a lot of these when I was a resident for cardiac issues and particularly for young patients it works well it never precludes these other options and we've got a very busy vibrant laryngology section in our group where they can do thyroplasties and injections and get benefit for our patients and so i don't fear this we can reconstitute these nerves if we have to take them for our patients and get them great benefit and so even in the setting where there's disease in the neck, and these are papillary nodes, you're relieving these nodes off of the patient from the neck, you're still able to keep that ANSA nerve, particularly the branch that's coming right here to the omohyoid, you wanna keep that nerve, and it's a great way to reconstruct a nerve if you ever needed to. Publication from our group showing some of the uh, results we've had from that, from that kind of technique. Um, in our traditional approach to thyroid cancer, everyone used to get a toll thyroid, particularly when I was a resident, radioactive iodine, and then thyroid hormone suppression based on studies by Bill Moria, where there was lower recurrence. 
we've gone away from that and that's a big advance. And so for patients with more favorable cancers, one to four centimeters, no extrathyroidal extension, we can consider a lobectomy based on uh, database studies, not prospective studies. And so um, I did a little COVID study with some of our endocrinologists, and this is important because for some of our patients, um, uh, we can continue to not have to give them hormone replacements if we don't do a total thyroid. And so about almost 70% of our patients don't need hormone replacement afterwards. The ones that will are going to be the ones that will most likely have Hashimoto's and they will be um, lesser preserved gland that are present. So think about maybe not doing as aggressive of a surgery for all patients. So many endocrinologists miss the good old days when almost all patients had a total thyroid. It was simpler. And so when do you do a total thyroid versus a, a lobe? Well, it's interesting. You know, you have to be flexible in your approach as I showed, uh, extensive preoperative uh, discussion. You have to be willing to ask the question. So during the cases, if I'm planning on doing a, a, a lobe, I always interrogate the central tissue for abnormal nodes. And I'm always consenting the patient for a possible total. And then as I showed in that prior case with the tax attorney, the initial treatment's not over until final pathology. So you may have to come back for a completion for patients. Predicting the biologic behavior of these cancers before treatment is so important to try to find out what's going to happen. And we already know that a little bit. When we see patients with a BRAF and TERP mutation, we know these patients are going to do worse. And so knowing these molecular markers is important. And so here's a 54-year-old patient felt a lump in her neck, rapid progression of anterior neck mass, voice was normal, normal uh, evaluation. And when you look at it on the ultrasound, you could see this mass here in this patient. The right side looks quite good. When we look at cross-sectional imaging, you could see this mass here. She doesn't want to go on hormone suppression. Can we do a lesser operation? This was, uh, you know, highly suspicious for a uh, cancer, Bethesda 5 on the FNA. So it was suspicious for papillary thyroid cancer. We're not quite doing this, um, but is there a role for molecular testing to influence the extent of surgery? And I think this is where it's going to go. And we know what our risk of malignancy is for these different Bethesda classes currently, but in the future, you start to wonder, can we start to do other testing? I have no uh, relationship with the firma, but when you get these undetermined, indeterminate areas, can we start to use the expression atlas to start to say this is going to be more favorable or less favorable. And I know some people that are investigating that. And so we might find certain mutations that might say there's targets or this is going to be less favorable. Let's look to do a total on this particular patient. Right now, we've been using Expression Atlas, next generation sequencing for the patients that are struggling, who are going to need that personalized treatment, systemic therapy, cancer progression. But maybe from the outset of treatment, we might want to think about using it. And once again, 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 it's coming down to molecular testing, finding these markers, finding out where we're going in the future with molecular testing to help our patients. An important study that came out from the American Head and Neck Society, and I'm really happy with this one. Um, we had Dr. Greg Randolph come as one of our speakers from our Florida Head and Neck course, and I was able to actually, Dr. Geiger just popped up right here on my screen. I could see on the side, she's one of the authors on this panel here. Dr. Geiger will be speaking. We invited her to speak at the HNS webinar in December uh, 14th on um, using um, some of these targeted therapies for patients. And so a very good document for everyone to kind of look at from the American Head and Neck Society. And so as we look at some of the other modern advancements we've had in describing our treatment response, I think this has been an advancement. A lot of times we'd say patients had recurrent disease, and I keep saying that over and go over again, recurrent disease. Well, some of these patients really had persistent disease, and we're looking at it from a dynamic risk stratification system put forth by Dr. Mike Tuttle and others, and, and really is endorsed by the ATA. And so within this, instead of looking at low, intermediate, high risk, we're looking at the response to treatment for patients. How have they done? Did they have an excellent response, biochemical incomplete, indeterminate, or structural incomplete response to treatment? And we're starting to get away from saying recurrent disease and saying, no, this is probably persistent disease, there's persistence versus recurrence, and you're only going to have recurrence after you've had an excellent response to treatment. And so this is not our whole author panel by far, but this is some of the initial study that's been laid, led by Dr. Zimmer, and we've wanted to look at this for our, in, for our more aggressive patients with tall cell variant. And so we'll have quite a few authors on this paper as we're looking to culminate in publication with it and looking at our tall cell variants. And we've had quite a few tall cell variants and we're gonna look at our dynamic risk stratification for these patients. 
And as we've looked at it with physical exams, imaging, labs, one of the things that we found is we actually have quite a large series of over 94 patients. And um, David uh, Zimmer and the rest of the group have been looking at their response to treatment. And interestingly, as we've selected out our 94 patients ultimately from our group, we've started to see um, the endpoints of local regional distant recurrence and then secondary outcomes of mortality and other interventions that are needed. And what David's seen here is all of a sudden we're seeing certain patients that are spreading out quite nicely where some patients who have an excellent response do great, even with these tall cell variants. So we're going to say you're going to do fine, probably. But ones that are biochemical or structural, not doing quite that well. And so maybe these are the patients we need to target early on for closer surveillance. Maybe these are patients we have to start getting tissue out for next generation sequencing to be prepared for the next steps of dealing with these patients and getting ahead of the curve on them in ways we've never gotten ahead of the curve in the past. Instead of being reactive, we'll start to be a bit more proactive. Um, Disease-free recurrence also, distance-free recurrence, same kind of thing David's seen with our results here of patients when they have an excellent response doing well and it's being borne out compared to other types of responses when they're not seeing that excellent response shortly after treatment. Finally, I'm going to end with some of our integration of neoadjuvant and adjuvant treatments in the care of our patients with invasive cancers. And so, uh, ATA guidelines came out a year ago for anaplastic thyroid cancer. I find this really fascinating, very, very interesting. I don't dread anaplastic patients as I used to in the past because I think we have so many more options for them. And so, in that paper from Dr. Geiger and the rest of the group for anaplastic cancer, it is critical to get immediate testing on patients. Now, we can send out next generation sequencing to look at all these gene mutations, rearrangements, in, in insertions, deletions. It takes time. We need rapid results. So we got to get BRAF testing immediately. We can do it through immunohistochemistry. We can do it through blood-based testing. Um, some are commercially available. So we need to do it because it's a game changer. And so it's a game changer from this study and other studies where Dibrafenib and trametinib are available to help with BRAF positive patients for their uh, treatment of anaplastic cancer. And there's some amazing results coming out where things that were unresectable can become potentially resectable. And so this is a case of a patient I had, a 63 year old patient, uh, history of an enlarging right neck mass. I shared her with Dr. Geiger. She was having a lot of difficulty swallowing foods. I knew it was a bad case, something was bad was going on. She had a history of breast cancer. Uh, this was the profile. It was felt to be a bit more favorable. Her past history wasn't uh, that um, significant. I got her on the OR schedule immediately um, after we saw this mass that was present and growing. We had done an FNA on it. The FNA actually was positive for malignant cells and it was favoring breast cancer. Again, we've done studies here, published them on our results for non-thyroidal metastasis to the thyroid, although when I, we spoke to the uh, the oncologist, they didn't think this was a breast cancer. And sure enough, uh, we had a bit of a diagnostic dilemma for this particular patient. And because I thought it was still resectable, I wanted to get her on quickly. We um, took her on after talking about it at the multidisciplinary tumor board. We talked with the endocrinologist. This is kind of what they often thinking. They're not sure what you have, but they still want to treat it aggressively. So we were off to the OR to treat it. Um, it ended up being discussed at our multidisciplinary tumor board, again, being shown. Um, did a uh, lobectomy, um, had her consented for a possible total. Frozen section was actually positive for malignant cells, but they couldn't say what it was. They thought maybe it was a, um, uh, a uh, uh, metastasis. And this is what our endocrinologists are thinking of the surgeons, actually. Let's just start cutting and see what happens. We do a little bit more than that, but... Uh, probably unfair on both parts. So I got the frozen, I held off on doing the other side and lo and behold, the final pathology did show anaplastic thyroid cancer arising in poorly differentiated uh, cancer, uh, all the supportive evidence for that anaplastic thyroid cancer. And so once again, we got to get more information. The tissue sent for minohistochemistry, unfortunately it was BRAF negative actually. Um, it was PDL1 was sent for looking at that, even though there's a disclaimer that doesn't really allow a good interpretation. Uh, Dr. Geiger sent it out for next generation sequencing. We want that profile on this patient to see potential targets for this patient because we know this is about as favorable as it could be for anaplastic, but it's still not something good to have in your neck. And so we ended up uh, treating the patient with um, radiation and uh, paclitaxel carboplatinum. I'm happy to say I saw her about a week ago. 
she's now approaching two, two and a half years, and she's been the uh, free of disease. And so I think probably going to be cured, which is which is wonderful. But you want that information, particularly in an unresectable cancer. So if this was unresectable, I might have thought about maybe doing a core biopsy. And that's what you want to do to get the information, more of a core biopsy for an anaplastic concern. And so this is a picture of her scan. As I said, I only did the lobe. I kept the other side. I am not going to go back probably to take out that other normal appearing thyroid for risk of papillary there. We'll see. We'll probably follow that. And, uh, and I think she's doing quite well, fortunately, with that kind of diagnosis. And so I'm excited about this study that is now open. So for everyone involved here, I think most people are aware of this, but um, our friend Mark Zafario from MD Anderson, who Dr. Ku and Silver train with, and I've gotten to know over the years so well, has invited us to be a part of this multi-center study that he's the PI on. And um, I'm working with Dr. Uh, Amrula uh, uh, Yil Yilmaz with it and looking to use both um, dibrafenib and trametinib and, and add Pembro. And so the gist of it will be that um, the patient will get um, Pembro and then the dibrafenib, trametinib, and then hopefully we get this window where something unresectable gives us a chance to do surgery. And, and that's what we're gonna look to do. And the study is open. So if you have patients that are coming in there, we're looking to get patients enrolled. Um, we're gonna look at primary outcomes of mostly gross surgical resection, R0, R1 resections, and then looking at secondary outcomes too to see how efficacious the, the protocol is. Um, I put this in a couple of lectures in the past, but um, this is a picture that many people are familiar with. Uh, Scully being the, uh, uh, Sully, I'm sorry, being the um, hero that he was, saving not one single life got, you know, lost in, in on the Hudson River there. And and I think, you know, one of the beauties that we've had, particularly within our institute and, and our ability is just to take care of all these eventualities that might come up for these difficult thyroid cancers and, and being able to rehabilitate patients. and and get good outcomes for them, even in very, very difficult situations. So thanks a lot for your attention. It's been a great group to work with. Thanks a lot, Dr. Ku, for, for leading the charge with the Grand Rounds. And uh, I don't think we have a ton of time, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions here or, or offline separately, so. Thank you, Dr. Sharflip, for the amazing comprehensive overview of the advanced um, management of advanced thyroid cancer. Um, very impressed with all the experience and knowledge that you uh, have built. So um, we do maybe have like two, three minutes if everyone's okay they to applaud for a, a, a few questions. Feel free to either uh, raise hands or you can just chime in. Hey Joe, uh, quick question. As, as we start to get more targeted therapies for these aggressive variants, do you foresee kind of uh, less invasive surgeries moving forward? Uh, kind of some of the things that you were talking about in terms of like laryngectomies and, and radical resections, having a partial, even a partial response um, with targeted therapy? Yeah, I, Eric, I think so. I think that's the goal. There's studies that are out there now. Greg Randolph invited us to join him, and maybe we will uh, for a study using lumvatinib um, for some of these ones, kind of a dirty, as Dr. Guy calls a dirty <laughs> agent to try to make some of these more invasive surgeries less invasive ahead of time. One of the disappointments with some of them too, and, and Dr. Geiger will know better than I, but, you know, as well as these, um, uh, these um, agents have worked against anaplastic, Dibrafenib, trametinib, they're not working great against papillary thyroid cancers, invasive papillary thyroid cancers. And so hopefully we will get better agents, better targets, but that would be ultimately the goal, I think, certainly. Anybody else with questions? I have one. So, um, Obviously, ANSA to uh, recurrent is an option. Do you ever do like either direct neurography or um, cable crafting for recurrent? And how effective is that versus the ANSA? Yeah. So a direct, so um, a direct closure is actually kind of an interesting question. I mean, if you had a um, an injury to a nerve, let's say, and you were not under tension. It might be controversial because there is valerian degeneration. It might actually be better to put ants into that nerve and get a better 
reconstitution of function. You want no tension on it. Uh, but it, especially if you have a young patient, I've used all kinds of nerves. And I learned that from kind of some friends and his Jim Netterville in particular is, you know, he said, find a nerve to put into it. I've actually used the vagus nerve on some patients and swung it up under the subclavian and other areas to put right into um, the a recurrent nerve to get a, a anastomosis and get improved um, function for patients. So just make sure there's no tension on it, wherever, however you do that. The answer can get compromised in a neck dissection, so it's a nice option to sometimes do that, and I've been really happy with some of those results. Any last minute questions before we end this morning? All right, so uh, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Dr. Sharp, and hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, guys. Thanks,